Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Adelaide Biomed City uh, Research Mini Review Series. Uh, we're um, uh, broadcasting from uh, Flinders Medical Centre, so Southern Adelaide Local Health Network. And um, today's session is um, uh, silent on gastroenterology. And um, we're sort of very um, grateful to be joined by uh, our first speaker, uh, Associate Professor Erin Simons. She'll be talking about um, personalising bowel cancer prevention. And then uh, that, uh, she'll be followed by Professor Richard Heddle, and he'll be talking about adv advances in gastrointestinal physiology. So um, uh, this is a Q&A session, so you're welcome to type in any questions that you have into the uh, chat as well. And um, we acknowledge the traditional custodians uh, of the lands that we meet on today, and we respect their, uh, uh, the, the past, present and emerging um, there. So what I'll do now is I'll pass um, uh, on to Erin Simons to have our first speak, speaker. Uh, thank you, Simon. Let me just get my slides up. Um, one moment. Okay, have they appeared on the screen? Yep. yep. Okay, great. So thank you for the opportunity to present on behalf of my team today. So what a lot of our work is focused on is personalising bowel cancer prevention. So what I will share with you today is um, with what we've been doing. So we are the Bowel Health Service Team based in the Flinders Centre for Innovation in Cancer. And I'll be giving you some of the um, examples of our research capacity, um, which is clinical and basic research. And I'll give you an example of an actual biomarker research study that we're working on at the moment. And um, hopefully this can lead to some, some collaborations with people listening, which would be great. So firstly, colorectal cancer. The reason that we're interested in researching this particular cancer is because it is one of the most common cancers in Australia. It affects one in 13 of us. Um, and the good thing is that there is a screening program in place to help pick up bowel cancer in the general population. And this is done with the fecal or cold blood test or immunochemical test that I'll describe a little bit later. However, there are some groups of our population that could be at higher risk for bowel cancer. So if people have gastrointestinal symptoms or iron deficiency anemia, this may suggest that colorectal cancer is present. There's also people within our population who have a known increased risk for developing colorectal cancer. So these are people who have a significant family history of cancer. This accounts for about 5% of our population. And also people who have had previous, previous polyps or adenomas, they're also at a known increased risk for developing cancer themselves. Our third group of the population who might be at higher risk for a bowel cancer are those who've already had a colorectal cancer themselves. And we currently have about 55,000 people who have survived from bowel cancer. Unfortunately, these individuals do have a high risk for the cancer coming back again. So we need to make sure that we look after all of these groups to reduce the risk for bowel cancer. So how do we do us? How do we assess this in these three groups? So we've got our symptomatic group, our individuals at higher risk, and our bowel cancer survivors. And in each of these groups, they're all having colonoscopies. Some of them having multiple colonoscopies every couple of years. In our um, survivors from colorectal cancer, they might also be having regular CT scans and the protein biomarker blood tests. Now, the reason that colonoscopy is applied to all of these individuals is because it gives a good opportunity to viewing the entire bowel to look for abnormalities. So what can happen during the colonoscopy when a video is, is placed into the bowel is that these uh, colonic polyps, um, such as adenomas can be identified and because these adenomas, some of them might turn a little bit nasty and go on to develop into cancer, the colonoscopy gives the opportunity to remove them at the adenoma stage and even prevent the cancer from developing. The other good thing about the, um, the colonoscopy is it gives a chance for any cancers that are growing to be detected as early as possible. And it's known that 98% of bowel cancers can be treated successfully if found early. So is colonoscopy appropriate for everyone then? Well, what we need to consider is that there are currently already about 900,000 colonoscopies done per year in Australia. The need unfortunately outweighs the availability. This results in long waiting lists for procedures because of this limited capacity. 
So we've had a look at what the findings are in each of these different um, cohorts. And what we see that in people presenting for colonoscopy because of gastrointestinal symptoms, we see that 85% of them do not have significant findings. So they don't have the advanced adenomas and they don't have cancer found. So that's great, but it means a lot of colonoscopy is happening for um, sort of low yield. In our individuals who are at increased risk because of adenomas or a family history, 80% of them do not have any significant findings at their colonoscopy. Um, and what we know is that these two cohorts account for approximately 600,000 colonoscopies per year in Australia. With our bowel cancer survivors, they have the opposite problem that 25% of them still have recurrence because the current uh, monitoring tests that they undergo are not quite sensitive enough for them. So what my team is working towards is whether we can be more selective in working out which of our symptomatic and at-risk individuals need colonoscopy, and can we improve the monitoring options for people who've already survived bowel cancer. So I'll first give you an example of what work we're doing in the gastrointestinal symptom field. So for these individuals, it's quite a process before they end up having their colonoscopy. So when they present with symptoms, what we found in a review of 199 patients is that 67% of these individuals had already had their symptoms for more than six months before they saw their GP. Now, once they saw their GP and um, referred to a gastroenterologist and then referred for colonoscopy, the rule is the colonoscopy should be booked within three months because these are considered a bit urgent, these symptoms. Um, and quite a few cases are not booked within this time. Then when they eventually do have their um, colonoscopy, which could be at least a year after the symptoms first developed, what we're finding is that around 4% had cancer found and 11% had advanced adenoma found. Now, these are the people that we want to identify to work out how to get them to colonoscopy the fastest. So we've looked at whether we can just use the symptoms to work this out. And this was work done by my previous, um, one of my students, Dr. Ong. And what she found is that abdominal pain and iron deficiency anemia seem to be the most suggestive for having an advanced adenoma or cancer found. But if we only sent people to colonoscopy for that reason, we'd miss a lot of the important findings. So then we had a look at these bowel cancer screening tests, the fecal immunochemical tests, to see if this could improve the selection process. And what we found, if we only sent the symptomatic people um, to colonoscopy, if they also had a positive fecal test result based on a certain threshold, we could decrease the number of people having colonoscopy by 30%, but we'd also miss some of these important lesions. If we then also added a, um, one of the symptoms in, so iron deficiency anemia or, and or a positive fecal test, we would do a few more colonoscopies, but still an overall decrease, and we'd detect 93% of the advanced neoplasias. But what we want to do is not only reduce the colonoscopy workload by a lot, but also make sure we're detecting everything we want to detect. So we're wondering if we can improve the fecal test. And this is work that we're currently doing with a new NHMRC Ideas grant, where we'll be looking at both blood and fecal samples to discover new biomarkers for adenomas. We'll survey the patients to make sure they're happy with these, um, these testing options and then conduct a prospective uh, test. And this work is being, um, each part of this study is being run by uh, Jerry, Maddie and Rachel within our group. And to date, we've already enrolled 505 patients into this study and have been collecting blood uh, fecal samples as well as tissue samples. So that's a little bit about the work that we're doing in the symptomatic group, um, but I'll just now give you a, a bit of an overview of what we're doing in the other two groups to let you know what our capabilities are. So in the individuals having surveillance because they've had an adenoma or a family risk for bowel cancer, we're doing a number of activities. So one of them is an NHMRC grant that we're running at the moment. And so this is using a running a randomized clinical trial um, to extend the surveillance colonoscopy intervals based on these fecal hemoglobin levels. So we're hoping this will reduce the number of colonoscopies needed in a safe way. We're also banking up the fecal samples to lead to the development of new biomarkers to improve the detection of the neoplasia. And we've got our SCOOP program that some of you may have heard of before. So this is a, a long-term program, 20-year collection of longitudinal colonoscopy outcomes and patient demographics. And we're using this to answer clinical questions related to cancer prevention. So a really um, valuable data resource we've got. We've also started collecting patient reported outcomes to improve our clinical processes. 
Now in our cancer survivors, what we're doing in this field is developing new blood um, test biomarkers. So this is mainly with circulating tumor DNA. Now we've got an MRFF grant, MRFF grant to look at whether using circulating tumor DNA can be used to monitor the efficacy of treatment in patients with colorectal cancer. And this is by using a couple of methylated DNA biomarkers. We're also banking up plasma and tissue samples for the development of future biomarkers to try and improve the cancer detection as much as possible. So this was a very quick overview of my team's research capabilities with our overall goal is to personalise healthcare by using a combination of risk factors along with non-invasive biomarkers and shared decision making to improve the processes. We believe that this has the potential to safely reduce the number of unnecessary colonoscopies and detect cancer recurrence as early as possible, with the ultimate goal is to reduce cancer risk. So I'd just like to acknowledge the many um, team members who have contributed to these results. Um, and I thank you for your time today. My email is present if, um, if anybody would like to discuss future collaborations. Thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you so much, Erin, that's great. I'm just seeing on the uh, Q&A there, any questions that we have? Um, I thought just briefly, um, Maybe you can tell the, uh, the audience something about um, the SCOOP program. I know that uh, Professor Rob Padbury, uh, the Director of Surgery here, um, he always talks about SCOOP. <laughs> This is, um, could be a talk by itself, and I think it has been. Um, so the SCOOP program was um, commenced in 1999 under the direction of Professor Graham Young and Professor Peter Bampton, as they recognised that there was an issue with colonoscopies being done at the appropriate intervals. So what they did is they developed a nurse-led program as a quality improvement project, um, and what they found is the because colonoscopy should be recommended to be done at certain intervals. And what they found is they managed to improve within three months, the compliance with guidelines for colonoscopy intervals from about 37% up to 95% all in three months. So this was an amazing outcome and it has been running ever since. And we still have this, this great outcome and plus a very good data collection, which can be used to ensure um, quality, good quality practice with colonoscopies being done um, in the hospitals. Fantastic. Erin, thank you so much. Yeah, a nurse-led program, I think that's really important to consider as well. You know, um, here at Silence, 52% 50, of the workforce, so, you know, encourage them to, um, you know, participate as well. Mm. So fantastic. So thank you so much for that. Really appreciate it. Um, the second speaker that we have for our Salon gastroenterology uh, mini review is uh, Professor Richard Heddle, and he'll be discussing advances in Gastrointestinal Physiology at Flinders Medical Centre and Flinders University. And uh, yeah, we've just got his uh, slides come up here. So uh, welcome, uh, uh, Richard. Thanks very much. Um, I think the reason I've been asked to give the talk is firstly that I'm, I think, the oldest clinician involved in uh, the GI Physiology Labs at Flinders. Secondly, I, I first came to Flinders in 1979 as a medical residents. So I've got a fairly long history uh, idea of what's happened over the years. Um, this is a photo of uh, the Flinders campus now. It's very rather different to what it was when I was there in 1972, um, first year, doing first year medicine before going to the Adelaide Uni. Can I have the next slide, thanks. Um, the topic is gastrointestinal physiology at Flinders University and Flinders Medical Centre. And, and the point I want to get across is that I, we've got, I think, a fairly special network of laboratories ranging from basic physiology to applied physiology to clinical applications, which has evolved over the years. And it's kind of nice having multiple people working in related areas because there is quite a bit of commonality to the problems we have and to the solutions. Can I have the next slide? Um, now, there should, if you click that again, there should be some arrows come up. Yeah, and keep clicking, thank you. I thought that I'd be simple and start, and there should be one on the colon as well, yeah. I thought I'd be simple and do it, uh, start on an anatomical basis, starting from the top and working down. So the, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the oropharyngeal phase of swallowing and what we've done in that area. Can I have the next slide, thanks. 
Now, this is work that's been driven largely by Professor Tahu Mari and Charles Koch. And um, we've utilized um, a high resolution um, catheter with impedance and the pressure sensors are a centimeter apart. And we, we can record from the pharynx and record the pharyngeal stripping wave. But what's turned out to be more useful is recording the pressurization events that are shown on these, um, these examples, because that often tells you about um, whether the upper esophageal sphincter is relaxing appropriately. And it's, it's people that have these pan esophageal, pan pharyngeal pressurizations often are at high risk of aspiration. And this is clinically quite important stuff. I might just mention that this, this strategy was runner up in a Eureka Muse, Australian Museum Eureka prizes for technique. Um, basically, um, aspiration is a significant issue, particularly as one ages. And we got a surprise a few years back when we did a study looking at people 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80 and over 80, and applied the um, swallowing safety index that Tahu had developed working in little kids. Um, and that suggested virtually everyone over 80 is at risk of aspirating. And a good part of that increased risk is due to changes that occur with aging in the cricopharyngeus muscle, which is the muscle between the pharynx and the esophagus. Now, Tahu, along with colleagues in Leuven, um, has developed a thing called Swallow Gateway, which is patented and has been supported by Flinders University and is also supported by fees that people using it pay for the license to use it. Um, the methodology has been used in patients with oropharyngeal issues, including high dysphagia, people in the, coming out of intensive care with trouble swallowing, and a whole range of neurological diseases, including common diseases like Parkinson's disease and motor neurone disease. There's been a lot of collaboration with the ENT students at Flinders, with the speech therapy department, who of course see this group of patients, um, with the x-ray departments at REPAT and Flinders, and also with our overseas colleagues. Next slide, thanks. Now, turning to esophageal physiology, um, I was at Flinders, I think it was in 79 when John Dent arrived on the scene as the new keen young star specialist. And John introduced um, esophageal manometry using the what was then the novel dent sleeve to record from the lower esophageal sphincter, as well as perfused side holes as shown with this uh, catheter here. Um, using that equipment, there was a fair bit of basic physiology done, including establishing the importance of inappropriate lower esophageal sphincter relaxation as a cause of reflux. And this ultimately led to John having the light bulb idea that a, a new drug called omeprazole might be valuable in peptic esophagitis, and that perhaps this was a better market for the Astra than adrenal ulcer disease, which was their initial target. The study did show that omeprazole healed people with peptic esophagitis remarkably, and subsequent big studies show typically about an 80% um, healing rate at uh, eight weeks. Far, far better than that achieved with the existing drugs, which were the H2 receptor antagonists. This led to a, um, a, a boom in, in uh, therapy, medical therapy for reflux disease. We're still doing clinical studies, um, but use high resolution catheters um, with, in the esophageal context, impedance built in. And we also can measure pH um, at two points in the esophagus and also can do pH impedance studies. Um, and I, I make the point that although reflux disease superficially seems very simple, in fact, it's quite complicated in the sense that there's, there's quite a few people where the symptoms don't correlate with their physiology. So someone with long segment Barrett's can have really severe reflux disease and no symptoms. And somebody with um, bad heartburn can have um, 
effectively no reflux seen on pH study. We've also done studies uh, on, in achalasia, and in fact, uh, with the collaboration of all the adult esophageal labs in South Australia, we um, established we had the highest rate of achalasia in the world. And that was published back to back with a similar study from Peter Kirillis's group in Norwest Sh University, Chicago, which came up with an identical figure, suggesting that perhaps the diagnosis is missed in a lot of other places. Um, I've acknowledged we've got had excellent support from our two professional officers, Carly Bergstad and Laura Basenko, in the laboratory, and we have three clinicians who report studies have all got an interest in neurogastroenterology. Next slide, thanks. The, one of the pivotal things at Flinders was the Smooth Muscle Laboratory, which was established uh, quite a few years ago. And the work of Marcello Costa and John Furness, um, and subsequently David Watchow, who looked at the human colon in detail, and Simon Brooks from Nick Spencer, um, have really been pioneering in terms of our understanding of the structure and neuroanatomy of the small intestine in mammals. And um, also help to sort out the, uh, what transmitters were being released by which neurons and how the neurons extended up or down the gut. And this is pretty famous work. And talking to Simon recently, he said that the, they're now um, changed tack a bit because they've got access courtesy of the ethics committee and collaborative surgeons in bariatric surgery and colorectal surgery and patients were really willing to give consent to fresh human tissue that can go into an organ bath and be, be studied, if, as it were, alive um, to look at the integration of these networks. Um, next slide, thanks. Um, We've also got down the in, in our group, we've got um, Phil Denning, who I, I think I could comfortably say is the world's expert on the normal functioning of the colon. Um, the motility of the colon has largely been ill defined, and um, Phil and John Arkwright, who was a scientist from CSIRO, used a novel fiber optic catheter that's flexible and able to measure pressures at one centimeter intervals. And for the first time, really, one was able to differentiate the patterns of colonic motility. And this is an example of a prolonged study. And one can see that there's quite a lot of retrograde activity. There's quite a lot of up and down activity. And there's also, I think here, a propulsive, what we call a, a, a mass movement. And the mass movements tend to occur first thing in the morning when one's steroid levels are rising and the brain's about to wake up. And it's the reason why most of us use our bowels best in the morning or after breakfast. And this study put almost all the preceding studies of colonic motility at question because the um, interpretation of the patterns was affected by the fact that they weren't measuring at enough points. And this is an example of the catheter placed in the transverse colon coming down, going down to the rectum. But this lab also has a modern anorectal physiology lab complemented by anorectal ultrasound studies. And a, a Rebecca Rabbit, who's one of our colorectal surgeons, has an interest in continence um, and complements the scientist who runs that lab. The other, if I can have the next slide, thanks. The, the other thing I wanted to say is I skipped over the stomach. We're not currently doing any work in gastric physiology, but in fact, it was my area of expertise when I did my doctorate and my postdoc. Um, I actually worked with Keith Kelly at the Mayo Clinic, who's the man that more than anyone else, I think has established our modern understanding of gastric physiology. Um, We've had a lot of collaborations. I want to mention that we have very good linkage with this off gastric surgery group, particularly David Watson and Tim Bright, in terms of managing patients needing re surgery for reflux disease and achalasia. We have good relationships with like-minded colleagues in Melbourne and Sydney. The we run a monthly benign esophageal meeting across Adelaide. 
discussing the management of difficult benign esophageal cases, usually attended by Dr. Jenny Myers of the Queen Liz and surgeons and gastroenterologists from Flinders, the Royal Adelaide, Queen Liz and Lyle McEwen. We're trying to raise the standard of education of trainees um, in surgery and gastroenterology with regard to GI physiology, because I find that some of our advanced trainees don't have much physiological background. And also their exposure to entities included in the right classification, that is what one might call the functional diseases, which are actually very common. Um, I should also add that Flinders University um, has had multiple successful PhD candidates between the various laboratories. And we had recently a speech therapist who got a PhD from her studies. Um, and so it, it really has been a fertile area for postgraduate students. In terms of challenges, um, you're probably aware it's hard to get research funding for basic or translational research. Notably, one of the labs I've mentioned has NIH funding from America, but none from Australian sources. Um, and the other problem is in terms of the clinical services that when you, if you look at say the esophageal lab, um, the Medicare rebate doesn't cost, cover the cost of the service in any way. It barely covers the depreciation on the catheter each time we use it. So um, they're the challenges, um, but I hope I've convinced you that there's a reasonably big group of like-minded researchers in GI physiology, and we all know each other and intermittently talk to each other about the issues. And uh, I'm very happy to field any questions you've got. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Really appreciate um, your insights there. Uh, and we, we don't have any questions just, just yet, but I, I wanted to just follow up um, something from your last slide there, saying there's broad collaboration between services, relevant clinicians. You also mentioned about different sites, international collaborators. Yes. I guess, um, do you have any comment about how, how do you develop, um, you know, sustainable, um, reciprocal <laughs> collaboration? The strongest link is probably with Lurban, where they've got, that's where Jan Tack is, and he's a very yeah. famous European gastroenterologist, but the speech therapists there are, are using the same technology we're using. So how do we, how do you, how do we develop these collaborate, collaborations? Um, and I think, of... I think by meeting people, um, yeah. by reading their papers, and uh, I know Charles Cock and Tahu have travelled a fair bit to, to our collaborators internationally. It's interesting that, that, that that the people in Belgium and Holland and Australia, we're going down a different tack in terms of how we measure hypopharyngeal physiology than the Americans who want to do it just with pressures. And it's, it's much, much harder. With, it's much easier if you know when flows occurring to work out what, what the dynamics are. Yeah, look, that's excellent advice. I think you're right. Like, uh, you know, particularly with the pandemic, many people has been hard, but I think that's the way you can gain those, you know, traction and in those collaborations. It's not just us visiting them. We've had, we've had a number of the people from Leuven come out and start, visit the lab and, you know, look at things and we, we talk about things at length. So um, the, the other comment I'd have is that the, the there's not much um, that the business of the elderly patients with aspiration um, we actually need more clinical facilities that are geared to deal with that in other hospitals because, you know, at the moment we've got the only um, swelling disorders clinic. And so the speech, some of the speech therapists do good work. I think, I think that it needs to be a medical speech therapy sort of collaboration. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Thank Harold. You. Appreciate uh, your insights. Um, and that concludes the session for this afternoon. Uh, the next presentation next Tuesday, I believe, is um, Salen uh, on respiratory with Professor Robert Adams, I believe. Um, but yeah, thank you to Associate Professor Erin Simons as well. Really appreciate um, your time and talk there. And just a, a brief one, I guess, Salen Research Week. Uh, it's a full week program. Erin um, speaking there again. Uh, it's 26th to the 30th of September here at uh, Flinders Medical Center to the level five um, lecture theater um, complex. Um, we welcome everyone to come uh, in person or um, uh, virtually through our sort of live streams and that sort of thing. So thank you so much.
um, John Peltrami and Cara for organising today. Thank you.